Gentlemen of the press, the Monetary Policy Committee, MPC, of the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, held its 296th meeting on the 22nd and 23rd of July 2024 to review recent economic and financial developments, as well as assess risks to the outlook. Eleven members attended the meeting. Decisions of the MPC. The committee's decisions are as follows. One, raise the NPR by 50 basis points to 260 to 27.65% from 26.25%. Adjusted the asymmetric corridor around the NPR from plus 100 to minus 300 to plus 500 to minus 100 basic these points. Retain the cash reserve ratio of deposit money banks at 45% and merchant banks at 14%. Retain the liquidity ratio at 30%. Considerations. The committee was mindful of the effect of rising prices on households and businesses and expressed its resolve to take necessary measures to bring inflation under control. It re-emphasized its commitment to the bank's price stability mandate and remained optimistic that despite the June 2024 optic in headline inflation, Prices are expected to moderate in the near term. This is hinged on monetary policy gaining further traction in addition to recent measures by the fiscal authority to address food inflation. In its consideration, the committee noted the persistence of food inflation, which continues to undermine price stability. It was observed that while monetary policy has been moderating aggregate demand, rising food and energy costs continue to exert upward pressure on price development. The prevailing insecurity in food producing areas and high cost of transportation of farm produce are also contributing to this trend. Members were therefore not oblivious to the urgent benefit of addressing these challenges as it will offer a sustainable solution to the persistent pressure on food prices. Also noted in its consideration is the increasing activities of middlemen who often finance smallholder farmers, aggregate, hoard, and move farm produce across the border to neighboring countries. The committee suggested the need to put in check such activities in order to address the food supply deficit in the Nigerian market to moderate food prices. The MPC therefore resolved to sustain collaboration with the fiscal authority to ensure that inflationary pressure is subdued. In addition, the committee expressed optimism with the recent stopgap measures by the federal government to bridge the food supply deficit. In particular, 
the 150 day duty free import window for food commodities maize, husk brown rice, wheat, and cowpeas, amongst others, will moderate domestic food prices. It is noteworthy that these measures will not lead to direct injection of liquidity into the economy as to cause further inflation. While the measure is a welcome development and may prove effective in the short run, it is expedient that it is implemented with a defined exit strategy to avert a possible rollback of the recent gains in domestic food production. To support these initiatives, the bank is already engaging development finance institutions like the Bank of Industry, BOI, to ensure adequate support to industries with a focus on small and medium scale enterprises, SMEs. The MPC noted the narrowing spread between the various foreign exchange segments of the market, an indication of price discovery and improved market efficiency, thus reducing opportunities for arbitrage and speculation. The committee noted that the increase in the level of external reserves would further build confidence for a more stable exchange rate and thus urge the bank to explore available avenues to improve inflows, especially through diaspora remittances. In addition, members noted the efforts of the federal government and private sector towards improving domestic refining capacity, as this is expected to reduce foreign exchange currently being expended on the importation of refined petroleum products. The NPC noted the sustained resilience of the banking system reflected in improvements of key financial soundness indicators. Members further encouraged the continued need for close monitoring of the system as the implementation of the recapitalization exercise progresses. To consolidate on the gains thus far achieved, the committee re-emphasized its commitment to stay on course with its tightening cycle in view of the urgent need to address inflationary pressures. Key developments in the domestic and global economies. According to the National Bureau of Statistics, domestic headline inflation rose marginally to 34.19% in June 2024 from 33.95% in May 2024, driven by the continued rise in the year-on-year -year components of food and core inflation. Similarly, month-on-month -month headline inflation rose to 2.31% in June 2024 from 2.14% in the preceding month. The food and core components rose to 2.55% and 2.06% in June 2024 from 228 and 
2.01% in May, respectively. Real GDP year on year grew by 2.98% in the first quarter of 2024, compared with 3.46% in the fourth quarter of 2023 driven by both the oil and non-oil sectors. Staff forecasts, however, suggest that the domestic economy will grow by 3.38% in 2024, while the IMF has projected growth at 3.1% in 2024. As of July 18, 2024, external reserves stood at $37.05 billion, compared with $34.70 billion as at the end of June 2024. This represents 11 months of import goods and services cover. The global economy, according to the IMF, is forecast to grow at 3.2 and 3.3% in 2024 and 2025, respectively. Headwinds to the global projection remain the tight global financial conditions and ongoing geographical tensions associated with the wars in Gaza and Ukraine, both of which have significant impact on commodity prices and the global supply chain. <clears throat> global inflation is forecast to continue to decelerate marginally in 2024, but may stay above the long-run objectives of most advanced economy central banks. Global financial conditions may, therefore, remain broadly tight through 2024 and into 2025. The committee reaffirmed its commitment to continue to monitor developments in the global and domestic economies to guide policy and ensure that inflation expectations are adequately anchored. The next meeting of the committee will be held on the 23rd and 24th of September 2024. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Governor, sir. That was communique number 153, presented by the chairman of the MPC and the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Mr. Olayemi Kadusu. We will now take questions from the members of the press. Remember to state your name, your medium, and you ask your question. You are entitled to just a question. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, Mr. Governor, members of the MPC. I am Nancy Naji, the anchor of Moneyline in Antioniality. Uh, Mr. Governor, I think mine is pretty simple, uh, but I will start uh, by asking you to reiterate the rates again, uh, because it seems we're a bit lost with it. We didn't get uh, those rates, so uh, please do that. Uh, the simple question to you really is, um, you had a forum recently in Lagos, and um, then you reiterated as a policymaker, your commitment uh, to you know getting average Nigerians on the streets are uh, solving their problems. Uh, but Mr. Governor, we are also on the streets, and um, many Nigerians are really that average Nigerian you mentioned are really now severely hurting from the impacts of inflation. So my question to you is: Nigerians also are questioning and are skeptical 
about the measures that the central bank is taking is not, will it really address the issue and also fix the problem? So Mr. Governor, for those watching now, for those listening, I would like you to, uh, you know, perhaps tell Nigerians why this is uh, still uh, on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nancy. Again, let me just reiterate the committee's decisions on the rates. The committee's decisions are as follows. Raise the MPR by 50 basis points to 26.75% from 26.25%. From 26.75% from 26.25%. Adjusted the asymmetric corridor around the NPR from plus 100 to minus 300 to plus 500 to 100 basis points. Retain the cash reserve ratio of deposit money banks at 45% and merchant banks at 14% and retain the liquidity ratio at 30%. Okay, now to your question, which is a, a, a very valid question, and I think you are probably referring to um, a, an earlier submission, I think it was probably at a business day seminar, I believe, where I said, and really I merely reiterated a position I've always held on to, and that is that as policy makers, indeed specifically, as financial and economic policy makers, it is very important that we bear in mind the impact of our policies on the man on the street, on the average man on the street. And what gave me, why did I say this? Because many times, as um, people in finance, economics, you, they, they, some could be criticized for living in a bubble and being completely disconnected with what happens outside. And from my perspective as a policymaker, that is a failure. Ultimately, if we are doing all the things we are doing and we are not able to impact the mind on the street, ultimately, then what do we really say we've been doing? And I think sometimes when people look at figures too often, they may lose track of that. And that is why I said what I said, that it is so important that we continue to bear that in mind, that our policies must ultimately impact the man on the street. I hear you about the issues you've referred to, Nancy, but I think to adequately address that, it, it, it may be important to um, cast our minds back, okay, and ask ourselves, how did we get to where we are today? Okay, how did we get to where we are today? How did we get to a position where the central bank is using the policies that you say um, uh, you are wondering whether they are having their impact? Now, let's not forget that over a period of time, we've had an economy and have failed to diversify that economy. We would argue that uh, the Nigerian economy has basically been a monolithic one in which we've more or less depended on one source of revenue. Now, of course, a monolithic economy has its own risks. And part of those risks, of course, is that if anything happens to your dependency, then the whole system is get shaken. And I guess in many respects, that's part of what we're going through. Part of it, it's not all, it's certainly part of it. Because let's not forget there are, there are global headwinds as well. So it's part of it. And that going forward, we must ensure that we are able to craft policies that are sustainable, okay, and will bring a sustainable method of development for our people. There's no point in policies that are ad hoc and don't really take us to where we want to get to in the long term. Because in, in the business of policy crafting, we must have 
the long term in view. You don't have the long term in view, you end up paying for it later. So that's where I was coming from. And that um, such policies, of course, must take into consideration um, inclusiveness. Inclusiveness. And that is why at the central bank, um, the issue of financial inclusion has been a, an area of, of great focus. And then, in, of course, it's not just to talk about the policies alone, um, but the implementing process must be, it must be equally robust. And that is where the issue of institutions and strengthening institutions is relevant. Is relevant. No matter the um, policies you craft, if the institutions are not there to support those policies, then you will suboptimize. And again, from the central bank's perspective, that is very, very important. It is very key. Now, these things have to go hand in hand. There's no issue of, you know, doing one and expecting the other to follow. They have to go hand in hand, the crafting of the policies, the implementing of the policies. And um, of course, we also have to bear in mind that in the process, given the background I've just mentioned, some of these things, of course, have been with us over a period of time, with the result that um, the economy has suboptimized. Um, so in the short term, we may find that some of the policies being implemented may appear stringent. But I can assure you that into the medium and to the long term, definitely they will put us on the path of sustainability, which is important, please. It is very important, and that's why I made reference to it. We must focus on sustainable development. Um, we are also finding, and, and I think this will become more um, um, apparent with time, that our policies are beginning to cascade down and up because there's a period for transition mechanisms to have impact. But we find that gradually they are beginning to turn a, a negative corner. Okay, you know, bit by bit it's moving in, the, in, 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 a, in a relatively uh, more positive trajectory. We will continue to ensure that, uh, like I said earlier on, the process of implementing policies are those that we are very vigilant on and that um, we ensure that those who play in the, in the area that we supervise play by the rules because that's also very, very, very important. No, my name is Issa Puwa. I write for New Telegraph newspaper. As you rightly noted, inflation is still trending 34.19% in June. What is the bank assessment of this uh, impact on the households and the country power? And what is being done by the bank to stabilize the economy? Thank you very much, Mr. Um, clearly, two areas that um, pose a challenge. One is in the area of food inflation, which we all know has is, is, is been a bit of a challenge. And the other, of course, is in the area of um, foreign exchange and its own pass-through. Now, with respect to food, um, I would say that, and we said it in the NPC communique, that we notice um, the moves by the um, fiscal side to help taking on certain policies that are helping to moderate um, food inflation and we very much um, are encouraged by that. So we are hopeful. Um, don't forget that a while back we also made a donation of fertilizer which was also you, you given in with a view to help the situation going forward. Um, on the 
on the on the foreign exchange side because we all accept the fact that um, the foreign exchange pass through is very significant um, and I'm happy to say that we have seen um, positive outcomes from the tools that we have been using over the recent past. Um, for example, exchange rate has converged, um, limiting the opportunities for arbitrage, which is very important. Um, inflows have increased from 37.93% uh, between January and May uh, 2024 to um, 38.8 percent, I beg your pardon, to 38.8 billion. Um, and net inflows, more importantly actually, grew by 73.4 percent uh, May 2024, comparing this to May 2023. So that's very good news. And something I speak about all the time on the issue of diaspora remittances. And I'm very pleased to say that um, as at end of June, this had gone up to um, $2.34 billion in comparison to $1.58 billion for the corresponding period last year. Capital importation, again, between January and June, $5.92 billion relative to $1.77 billion for the corresponding period last year. So that's all very positive okay for foreign exchange um, um, management um, we've also seen that on the capital markets uh, policies uh, having the capital markets responding positively and of course the banking sector um, we've you know been very aggressive in giving guidance to the banks with respect to how uh, we want them to position themselves for uh, the future of the one trillion and dollar economy. Inflation targeting is something that is an ongoing process and which will be giving more and more guidance as we go along. Good afternoon, Mr. Governor. Yes. I am James Ebejo with this day. Um, the real sector players are really, you know, having the heat over the continuous hike in uh, interest rates. They have been complaining. I want to ask them, are you having any uh, engagement with them in order to you know, uh, make them see why this uh, is so? Because um, the way it is now, some of them are even saying that the jobs are threatened and all, all that. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, James. Yeah, the, 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 the straight answer to your question is yes. We are engaging with them. Um, we've had a number of different fora with them, both in some cases individually um, and in many cases collectively. And it's something that we will continue to do so, so to at least explain the reasons why we're taking some of the measures we are taking. However, I think I'll just say one or two things. One is to understand, and these are some of the things that we discuss with the, with the organized private sector, that inflation really and truly is having a major impact on our economy. Purchasing power is getting eroded, people are being pushed into different categories of poverty, and it is in their own interest that we are able to tame the scourge of inflation. If not, the ramifications will also be for them. It's not, it's not uh, on, on the on the average money loan, it should also be for them. And we understand the need for growth, and we also understand that it is, it, it is relatively challenging when you have high interest rates. We also understand that. And quite frankly, my belief is that it is so fundamental to the long-term future and stability of our economy that inflation should be brought under control, that in the short term, these are pains which ultimately will be able to help our economy and help the manufacturing um, businesses as well. However, it's also important to reflect on how we got to where we are, okay? And let's not forget that this was largely as a result of a tremendous amount of, uh, of liquidity that came into the system in a relatively short space of time. 
Okay, when you print money on ways and means, it has its consequences. And we are paying for those consequences right now, unfortunately.